So at MIT, uh, uh, Max is launching an experimental research program aimed at realizing his vision for next generation electronic systems based on emerging nanotechnologies and nano devices. So Max, thank you very much. Thank you. advances in AI hardware is the need to bring memory and logic together as closely as possible. The kinds of systems that Max is investigating at MIT precisely try to do that, really bring the memory and the, and the logic together with very high bandwidth and minimum energy consumption as you shout there back and forth. But Max will express it much better than me. Thank you. Great. No, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to uh, speak here today. Um, so as you heard, my name is Max, um, and today I'll be speaking about uh, focusing really on monolithic computing integration for enabling of next generation of hardware for these future uh, big abundant data AI type applications. Um, so let me start off with some good news and some bad news, I guess. Uh, so the good news is that there is so much data that's available for future systems and applications that this future of a smart, intelligent, uh, you know, world with the applications that leverage it is, is really becoming more realistic. But the bad news is the same, is that there is so much data available the electron systems today simply cannot keep up with it. Right? There's such an explosion of massive unstructured data being generated at such a fast pace that electronics today just can't keep up. And the reason why electronics are not able to keep up with the growing demands of all these applications is because electronics aren't just hitting one or two walls. It's a perfect storm. They're hitting many walls all at the exact same time. So as most of us probably are aware of, there's something called the power wall which stems from the fact that as we shrink the transistors smaller and smaller, they no longer become more and more energy efficient. So this is the end of more scaling, or more accurately you know, uh, called the end of Denard scaling. Then there's uh, the memory wall, which stems from the fact that uh, a processor today can spend the vast majority of its time and energy just moving data around a system. So in your laptop today, for instance, if you were to do a big abundant data application, you'd be spending over 90, 95% of your time and energy just moving data from your off-chip processor uh, to your off-chip memory, uh, back to processor, back to the memory again. Time and energy spent, no, I've been uh, doing useful computation. And then there's the communication wall, which is all the energy and, data and, and time spent uh, taking data from a sensor node, being up to the cloud, doing your computing, saying that results back down. And the list of walls goes on and on, the interconnect wall, the flexible wall, resiliency wall, and so on and so forth. So the question is, given all these walls, how are we possibly going to enable these new applications? So just to give you an example, uh, if we dig into this memory wall, for instance, there's some actual data running from actual class, uh, some actual uh, AI type uh, machine learning application. So this is genomics classification doing a stochastic gradient descent. It's a key part of uh, some deep learning, for instance. And here you see 95% of your time and energy is spent not doing computing, just moving data around the system. So the question is, how are we going to overcome all these walls and enable the next generation of hardware for these huge applications. Well, on one hand, uh, one approach is to leverage new types of devices, new types of uh, transistors or memory cells. And while this is extremely important work, I work in this field, it faces some major challenges. Uh, for many of these new devices, we can't even build them yet. And even if you could, and this is a very important point, even if you could give me the best transistor or memory cell in the entire world, you would still only see limited benefits for applications as the device level inefficiencies themselves only account for a very small portion of the total system level inefficiencies. So for instance, the best transistor in the world might address the power wall, but it wouldn't address uh, the memory wall I spoke about previously. So a second separate way we try to improve computing is by creating new computing architectures using things like relying on multiple cores or specialized accelerators. And while this is also very important work, it too faces many challenges. There are only a limited number of design tricks we can play, and we play many of these already today. And making systems more complex to hide inefficiencies is not a free lunch. As we make systems more complex, we have to deal with more design bugs, for instance, which are the dominant cost and time of making a chip today. So what's the solution? Well, I think it's safe to say that if we really want to enable the next giant leap in computing, that new advances and new approaches uh, are required. So in today's talk, what I want to speak about is, can we get to the next level, or is this game over? 
I'm going to argue it's in fact game on. We can get to the next level of computing through three key approaches, um, which is what I like to call nanosystems. <coughs> Uh, so what exactly is a nanosystem? Well, a nanosystem is when we start by taking these new emerging technologies, these new types of devices, new fabrication techniques, new types of sensors, etc. And only by first overcoming their imperfections and problems can we then actually combine their benefits in order to realize revolutionary new system architectures, which in turn can enable a whole new class of these future big abundant data applications. And I always say that while well, each sphere of work here is important and necessary in its own right, it's only by connecting and combining the right emerging technologies with the right system architectures for the right applications, which allow us to achieve these truly massive, you know, thousand x uh, type of benefits. And what I really want to emphasize about this approach of, of nanosystems is that it really does require advances across the entire system stack that are coordinated, which I think speaks exactly to the purpose of this workshop. That just relying on new devices and new architectures and new types of software is not enough but we need to have this coordinated advance across the entire system tap to really do something special. Okay, so today that's what I hope to speak to you about. I want to start by showing you that at the device level, it's game on, that computing is not dead, that we still can get the next more than 10x benefit in computing by using new devices. But that's not enough. That we can use these new devices in order to realize new types of systems and architectures, like <coughs> monolithic 3D systems, to completely change the rules of the game. And then thirdly, and most importantly, I want to show you that these aren't just slides and just words coming out of my mouth at, at this you know, presentation here, but that we're actually able to do some really exciting new applications today using these new types of systems, using these new types of technologies. Okay, so let's dig on this first point talking about some new technologies to enable these new systems and architectures. So technology which I have focused on really for half of my entire life uh, is a, a technology called a carbon nanotube. So a carbon nanotube, uh, let's make sure we're on the same page here, where C and T is just a rolled up sheet of graphene from a nanocylinder with a diameter of around one, one and a half nanometer. A carbon nanotube field effect transistor, where C and FET, is uh, uh, formed by using the C and T's as the channel of the transistor with tra traditional fabricated source drain and gate electrodes. So basically imagine any regular silicon transistor. You just take up a silicon from the channel, replace that with carbon nanotubes, and voila, Everything stays exactly the same. Okay, so uh, here at MIT we've done a lot of work on C effects. So for instance, in addition to uh, uh, enabling the next 10x gain in uh, computing performance, you can also scale to more aggressive nodes. So we've shown, for instance, the most scaled digital logic ever here at uh, MIT. This is a sub-3 nanometer technology node, uh, C and FAT, uh, where the challenge <coughs> transistor is now around 100 or so atoms to give you the scalability of using these Okay, so how do you make a circuit out of them? Well, this is a schematic of the simplest circuit, just an inverter. You have uh, P-type transistors in the pull-up network, N-type transistors in the pull-down network, and the design follows any traditional CMOS design flow. So it still follows the exact same flow that we use to make silicon chips. The entire infrastructure stays the same. And by the way, if you want to do more than computing, if you want to make a sensor, for instance, you can functionalize the CNTs in one of these transistors uh, by putting a functionalization on top of the CNTs, and now it's a sensor, where the sensitivity and selectivity of that sensor is determined by the functionalization that we put on top of the CNT. Okay, so over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a lot of progress in the field of carbon nanotubes. Uh, from about you know, 20 years ago or so, the first CN FATs ever uh, built using a single carbon nanotube were made uh, both at IBM and at the same time at Delphi University. About 10 years ago or so, uh, work, uh, a lot of this done at Stanford, some of which was the focus of my PhD. Uh, was being done to overcome some of the inherent imperfections associated with the new technologies, which have prohibited people from building any type of systems out of them, um, to about five years ago, where for the first time we could actually build working systems out of carbon nanotubes, uh, such as a basic microprocessor built entirely from CNFX. Uh, but of course, work hasn't stopped there since. So since coming here at MIT, we've uh, uh, completely reinvented how we manufacture and build circuits using CNTs. I'll give you a couple very quick examples of this. So one key piece of progress is the ability to now do CMOS, which is essential for energy efficient circuits. So not just one or two devices, but we can make arrays of CNFETs and uh, have them all working for both P and N type transistors. Uh, but you'll notice in these plots from some actual data that we've measured another problem, which is that it doesn't look so nice. Some of these transistors are, are leaky, they don't turn off. 
Right? And this is due to the presence of what we call metallic carbon nanotubes. So I'll show you this really quickly. So if here's our transistor, ideally all the CNTs in the channel would be semiconducting. <coughs> Means you can turn it on and off with the gate. Uh, this is an actual measured curve from one transistor with all semiconducting CNTs. You see it has ideal switching properties. But unfortunately, any time we grow CNTs, some percentage of these CNTs will be metallic, which due to the diameter and chirality of the CNT, have a band gap of zero or close to zero. And those can't be turned off by the gate, so they are, are always on, and they leak power and can cause incorrect logic functionality. Uh, so to overcome this problem, there are uh, a couple uh, approaches. So one approach would be just don't grow any. So grow these all to be semiconducting CNTs. That's the best case solution, but it is impossible. And I've been saying this for over 10 years now. It is still impossible, and I think it will forever be impossible. Uh, so the next best thing we can do is remove the metallic CNTs post-growth. But the best that's been done is 99.99% purity. And if you imagine 0.01% of CNTs being metallic might seem like a small number. But when you have billions with the B number of CNTs, 0.01% of a billion is a, it's a big number. I can't do the math. But, uh, 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 it's a, still a lot of metallic CNTs in the circuit. Okay, so what's the solution? Well, we have this brand new technique at MIT, which allows us to actually design circuits to be completely immune to those remaining few percentage of metallic carbon nanotubes. So, for instance, if you just built a, a regular circuit like we do today, it turns out that in order for the metallic CNTs not to cause an incorrect logic functionality, to cause a, a short that would mess up your computing somewhere, that you require around eight nines purity. So you need 99.9999999% metallic CNT, uh, semiconductor TNT. Put that in perspective, that's about as pure as we can get a silicon wafer, which is the most well-controlled material in human history. I think the feasibility of doing this would be uh, nearly impossible. Uh, so when I had my student figure out what purity we needed, and he told me we needed eight nines actually, it was very depressing, I thought that would be the end of the road. But as I mentioned, he came up with this design technique which, uh, for the sake of time, I won't go through the details of, but allows us to design circuits in such a way to be immune to those metallic CNTs. So we can design circuits with what's already attainable today, 99.9% semiconductor CNTs, and guarantee that those rem remaining metallic CNTs wouldn't cause a problem uh, with our circuit. Okay, so uh, uh, since uh, uh, using this technique, we've had a lot of success in actually showing we can actually build working circuits using carbon nanotubes. The proof is ultimately the pudding, so to speak. So uh, just a couple of months ago, we showed the first mixed signal circuits using CNFET CMOS. These totaled around 2,000 CNFETs down the circuit. Uh, at the upcoming VLSI, we'll show uh, a monolithic 3D imager. I'll speak about monolithic 3D pretty soon, where we basically have an imager on one plane of the circuit, and then right on top, we build a layer of carbon nanotube logic, and right on top of that, more carbon nanotube logic. So the imager takes data in on the bottom plane, and then in real time moves all that data right up to the next layer of logic right on top of it, which does uh, actually like thresholding and digitization. And all that data in parallel goes right up to the layer of computing built directly on top of that, uh, which actually does uh, 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 edge detection, and could be, for instance, classification. Now you have a camera that in real time no longer outputs RGB values to your memory, which they do do all this massive computing on to do classification. But in real time, your camera for every frame no longer has pixels information, it's now classification, or what it's actually seen. Uh, also, at uh, Upcoming VLSI, we'll show the first S arrays. These total close to 10,000 CNFETs now. And uh, as we'll get to at the end of this talk, we're actually integrating CNFETs inside of uh, commercial labs as well as foundries at 150, 200 millimeter scale. Okay, so I, I hope I've been able to show you that there's been a lot of progress in the field of, of CNTs, that using these new technologies might not seem so infeasible anymore. But that's still building the same systems that we build today, just using a new transistor. I told you that's not going to be quite enough. So how do we do even better, right? How do we get to not a 10x benefit, but a 1,000x benefit? Well, if you want to do even better, you need to combine the advances you can have at the device scale with the benefits you can leverage at the system or architectural level. And to that end, 3D integration is a very promising path. Now, 3D integration today is achieved through chip stacking. So this is when you build uh, the different vertical layers of, of your system on separate 2D chips, and then physically stack and bond them on top of each other using through silicon views or TSVs to connect the different vertical layers of the system. 
Now, uh, these TSVs are very large, bulky, and sparse, which limits the vertical density and thus the physical conductivity between the layers of the chips. So what I'll show you experimentally is the dream of 3D, which is monolithic 3D integration. And this is when we can build each of these vertical layers directly on top of one another on the same starting substrate. So no way for bonding required. Because of this monolithic 3D integration, we can use our nanoscale Vs or ILVs to connect these different vertical layers of this chip, which are orders of magnitude more than 1,000 x denser than TSV. Uh, and where we can really leverage this massive increase in vertical connectivity is not just doing layers of computing on top of computing, but doing layers of computing with memory and even uh, sensing, for instance. Because now this massive increase in vertical connectivity directly translates into an equally large increase in our logic to memory bandwidth, which has serious positive impacts for our systems today, both in terms of energy and performance. I've listed three examples of how so, but by no means is this list exhausted. So your memory access time is reduced, so your processor spends less time being idle just waiting to get data from memory. Your memory access energy is also reduced because the logic and memory is stacked in such close proximity, and you also have less resource contention due to the wide connectivity between the layers of logic and memory in your system. Okay, now, uh, despite the, the promise of monolithic 3D, there's always a catch, right? So when something sounds too good to be true, it often is. And the catch here is that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to build with today's regular technologies. The processing temperature for all the upper layers of the circuits has to be very low, below 400 degrees C. If you go above this, you'll melt and damage the bottom layer circuits uh, in your chip, and also just melt the back of the metal interconnects with them. And there's a particular challenge for silicon, which is processing temperatures in excess of over 1,000 degrees Celsius. So this is where we can really leverage and make use of these new technologies. Uh, for logic and sensing, carbon nanotubes, for memory, there's a whole host to use. Uh, we focus on RM, uh, where now these technologies can be built at very low temperatures, below 200 degrees C, almost at room temperature, well within our thermal budget. And what I really want to emphasize about this approach is that we really need, now do get the combined benefits of using these energy-efficient, high-performing devices with these energy-efficient, high-performing architectures, which are naturally enabled by using these new devices to begin with. And the most exciting part of this approach is that, as I mentioned, these aren't just cartoons, but we can actually build these systems today. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. This was the first monolith 3D system that we realized. It was a 3D nanosystem. It uh, had four layers of C and FETs and RM memory, as well as sensing on the top layer. Uh, we actually built this. This is a picture of what it looks like. To give you an idea of what's inside the system, we start with a regular layer of silicon CMOS, just like a normal chip that you can tape out from any foundry in the world. We do uh, the regular metal back and line processing. I'll re-emphasize that these vias are very, very dense because this is monolithic 3D integration, over a thousand times denser than what people do with 3D chips back in the day. Right on top of that, we build a layer of computing using carbon nanotubes. It does two things. It acts as memory access circuitry which is critical for enabling that high bandwidth between layers of logic underneath and the memory we'll be building on top shortly, as well as many embedded classification accelerators for on-chip embedded machine learning. And I'll show you more about this shortly. Then we, again, we do metals, uh, metal layers in between. We then do a third layer of the chip, which in this instance we choose to be memory using RAM. Then again, we do more metal layers, and we build a fourth layer of the chip, and we make these carbon nanotubes. If you zoom in, you can even see the CNTs inside of one of these CN facts. They go one step further to demonstrate that these future systems uh, that we want to be intelligent can do more than just crunch numbers, but actually interact with the outside world. We'll transform a million of these transistors on the top layer to be sensors. So now we have a system that has over one million embedded uh, gas sensors in this instance, built directly onto the top layer of this chip. When we take a look at these types of systems that have millions or billions of sensors built directly into the top layer of this chip, all connected in parallel to millions or billions of interconnects to layers of memories underneath, and to the millions of interconnects to computing and classification accelerators built directly underneath that. These systems can and do today capture terabytes of information each second from the outside world, store that data in on chip memory, and compute on it in real time, transforming massive data input into highly processed, useful information. And it, uh, uh, the takeaway from that demonstration was not that we can make a, a nice gas sensor. It was much deeper than that is what 3D nanosystem is and what this uh, approach is, it's really a platform. It's a demonstration for what future systems have to look like and should look like if we want to enable this next generation of uh, intelligent, smart AI applications. 
right. I've listed of you know, three requirements that the systems have to have and how this achieve that. So first, we know we need to overcome the power wall by having energy efficient devices. We can do that by using these new technologies uh, like carbon additives and RM, both for logic and for memory. But we also, that's not enough. If you really want to enable these new applications which require mass amounts of data, you need to overcome the memory wall and be able to pass mass amounts of data between logic and memory. We can do that through leveraging this monolithic 3D integration, which is enabled by using these new devices. And moreover, if you want systems to do more than just crunch numbers, right? if you want systems to interact with the outside world and truly be intelligent, then you want systems to integrate that sensing directly uh, on chip, which we can also do with these new technologies that enable not just great transistors, but also great types of sensors. So these are the major takeaways from that demonstration. And uh, I'm excited that the work hasn't ended there, right? Because that's just a, a demonstration, an important demonstration, but something still done in academic lab. So how do we actually take these new systems and actually get them out into the real world? Well, I'm, I'm excited to say that that work is happening now, and it takes, again, progress across the entire system stack, from the material level with new types of material, new processing techniques, new design techniques. I mentioned briefly some processing for the CMOS and the design for the metallic CNTs all the way to actually introducing carbon nanotubes inside of some uh, uh, actual uh, commercial facilities today. Let me give you uh, two quick examples of uh, how carbon nanotubes can have an impact in the world in, in the not so distant future. So this is uh, the first application. This is a very close uh, 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 collaboration we have with us here at MIT, our very close friends at Animal Devices, as well as uh, clinicians over at MGH uh, in the healthcare space. So the goal is, well, why don't we take a system like this that has millions or billions of sensors, of gas sensors, instead of sensing, uh, I sense different types of alcohol. Uh, as a PhD student at the time, so I sense like alcohol, wine, beer, vodka, these types of things. I could tell the difference between them, like core versus Stella. I could, I could tell them, learn the difference between those. But hey, that, that's interesting, even though it's but what about if we apply this to disease? Uh, so we're actually doing that now. We've actually just finished the, the first uh, kind of trial over to MGH, where instead of sensing what's inside someone's breath, we're sensing bacteria growing inside a petri dish. Because bacteria is growing and living and breathing just like us. They exhale and smell. Uh, when you have bad breath, it's due to bacteria growing in your mouth. If you have smelly feet, it's bacteria growing in your shoes. Uh, I'm sure anyone has those issues, but it's caused by bacteria. And uh, actually, the old technicians uh, who work in, over at MGH in these hospitals can actually walk a petri dish that's growing bacteria and we'll actually be able to tell what it smells like. If it's uh, buttery, it smells like a, a popcorn in a movie theater, they know, oh, it's this type of bacteria. And if it smells like a farm or manure, then it's, it's a different type of bacteria. And if it smells like sneakers, it's a different type of bacteria. They can actually ID it that way. Um, so we're actually putting these chips inside, making the electronic petri dishes, and can actually smell and identify bacteria. and actually beat state-of-the-art diagnostics that they actually do in the lab over an MGH today. So uh, that's one example. Let me give you another very quick second example of how these technologies are actually making a difference. And this is in the computing space for these future abundant data applications. This is a, a DARPA program. It's called 3 to c It's part of the ERI. It's led by us here at MIT. Uh, very close collaborators at Stanford, who are actually my advisors. Uh, a company that makes these new materials, as well as Skyward Technology Foundry, which is a DMA US trusted foundry here in the US. And the goal of 3 to c is to transform a 2D system like this that has separate computing nodes, off-chip memory, which is, uh, faces all these challenges I mentioned for these big abundant data applications, and say, hey, what about making this system that I showed you previously, right? These monolithic 3D systems that have multiple layers of memory and computing finally intertwined within this 3D stack, with these dense uh, uh, metal interconnects. So for layers of memory, as I mentioned, we're using RM, this immersion on volatile memory, for uh, logic, we're using uh, carbon nanotubes integrated at a slightly relaxed 9 nanometer node. Uh, and just to give you some projections, this work comes from Stanford as part of this program. Uh, when compared to the same node versus silicon versus a regular 2D chip, state of the art, versus our kind of new 3D systems, uh, you see that the benefit here is over a thousand X, or around a thousand X benefit in energy delay product. And where a lot of that benefit comes from is reducing all this time that's spent in the processor being idle, just basically doing memory axes, and instead doing useful computing during that time. So instead of you know, spending 95% of your time talking to memory, that's flipped on its head. Now you spend 95% of your time doing useful uh, computing. Okay. And I want to mention that that is really just the beginning. Uh, 
uh, to highlight kind of this last point, you know, these uh, massive benefits are enabled by using these new devices, building new systems, but that's it. We haven't changed the software stack. We haven't optimized architecture. So let me give you uh, some food for thought here, um, you know, for, for conversation, right? So uh, a lot of the competing system today is built around hiding inefficiencies. We do things like prefetching. Right? There's a lot of hardware that we use today to actually make systems look more efficient than they actually are. Well, if you don't have these sources of inefficiencies, can you actually simplify your hardware? Right? Can you get rid of all these things that you no longer need? And surely, what about the software, right? So if all of a sudden my mode of computing has changed, if I no longer uh, have to be so worried about the memory axes, surely I impact the software I write to run these systems. So maybe there are even more benefits there. So I think these benefits I'm talking about are really just the beginning. Uh, as I mentioned, I really think it's game on to that next level. So uh, with that, I'll wrap up. I hope I've been able to show you that this concept of nanosystems is useful today. It really is key to enabling these future big abundant data applications. And that it's not just pie in the sky, some dream. We're actually able to begin transferring this technology from you know, academic labs into commercial fabs to make real checks. Uh, obviously, you want to thank our sponsors. The students do all the work. And I'll uh, wrap up with that. Thank you much. So thank you. Question. Yeah, yeah, good question. So, so the question is yield, and I'll uh, expand, expand it a, a tiny bit, right? So there's yield both because you're using new technologies, and there's also yield because when you make more layers of the circuit, your yield decreases exponentially, right? So there are uh, uh, many approaches to deal with this type of problem. Uh, one thing I'll mention is the systems that we're building now uh, are much, much bigger than anything I, I, I actually talked about in the slides. So systems that are comparable to systems that you could actually by made from silicon fats. Um, and those systems use no redundancy uh, what, whatsoever. So it's the exact same system you tape out, it either works or it doesn't work um, from the technology perspective. So when doing these 3D systems, then uh, of course you know, yield is uh, a challenge. Um, and there are many approaches to deal with yield. It's actually a component of the 3D SSC program that we have. So um, there's a, um, a you know, for, for, for memory, for instance, on the upper layers, right? There are many approaches that people take to dealing with errors of memory. For logic, it's a little more complex. So how we design systems today is we keep a lot of computing, the processors, on the very bottom layer. And then right on top, do memory access circuitry right on top of that memory. So it alleviates the problem mostly through design. Um, but uh, in the future, if you want to do more kind of flexible design with computing, like hardware processor cores on any arbitrary layer, then uh, It'll, it, it's something that you know continues to you know, continue to work on, and a lot of stuff through design, you know, processing like cloud organization. So. Questions? Yes. I was just really curious about the scalability of the three D stacking architecture. You know, uh, obviously thermal thermal issues, as as you pointed out, the experience of scale, not just virtual, but also on How big can you uh, spread out? Yeah, yeah. So our so our yield limitations are the exact same as, as any other technology. So uh, what you can yield, uh, um, you know, what limits the size of a silicon chip in terms of yield, it's the exact same equations that impact our yield. And it comes down to cost, right? If you want to, and this is you know we actually drove Moore's law. Uh, if you want to uh, put more transistors in your chip, you're going to yield fewer chips. Um, that being said. I think uh, you know the notion of these three D chips. When you start having many, many different processor cores, for instance, that each have their own access to memory, it becomes very distributed, right? So you can think of, as I mentioned, like new computing paradigm. We're just like the internet. When one node goes down, the entire internet doesn't crash, right? So you have resiliency in mass amounts of resources. But I think likewise in these types of systems, there are many ways to address the yield, right? There are many 
kind of intelligence smart ways to adjust yield, which are the things that we're looking at. Um, in terms of thermal, uh, there's processing and design approaches there. So right now, as I mentioned, we keep the processing cores on the bottom layer of the chip. Uh, one of the key reasons for that is that's also where the thermal heat sinks are. Um, the memory isn't what generates the heat, it's the processing cores, right? But in the future, if you do want to, for whatever reason, put you know, 100 cores on the 100th layer of a system, then you will need to in integrate new types of materials which are ideally suited for these types of you know, thermal man management and heat spreaders. So you know, Tomas back there works in graphene. We both talked about you know, graphene for thermal heat spreaders, for instance. So uh, it's not a show stuff right now, but if you want more flexibility, then more innovations will have to be made. One final question. No, 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 great question. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so if you're familiar with RM, uh, this is a bipolar, it's a regular half new oxide, like, you know, 10 nitrate high sac. Um, very mature, and that's where we're using it, because uh, the foundry is integrating it. Um, and uh, uh, for the, uh, there's a lot of work going on in academia right now and in industry to integrate selectors into the cell, uh, but currently we're still using transistors. And typically this would be a huge problem. Because now, you know, your memory is here, your transistor, your silicon transistors are like 1T, and then that means to the side of the chip is where you have your processor. So even if you try and do like memory, you know, memory over logic, if you have all these selectors there and your memory access circuitry, it's still off to the side for your processor, so you're still constrained with kind of pin limited access or kind of routing access to, the, to this memory. But for us, because we can do layers of transistors on the top layer, it's an easy solution. So what we've already done, already taped out from the foundry, is we have layers of memory. Right underneath that, we build a layer of transistors using carbon nanotubes. And right underneath that, we then have memory access circuitry like decoders and muxes and sensams. And right underneath that, we then have, right now we haven't built 64 cores, but we have a core or you know, more cores, right? Which all can talk their own little splice of memory. So uh, we can naturally kind of overcome these types of challenges through these new uh, systems. Thank you, Max. We'll move on.